Hello, everybody, and welcome. I hope the system is recording. Yeah. All right. So, hi, everybody, and welcome to uh, this amazing initiative by Steve Hardigan, uh, Revolution in Education. Uh, I think um, what Steve is doing is really amazing, and I want to thank you uh, for coming. Let me get the, uh, there, I had my video. Uh, for coming on this day. If you could just add in the chat box where you're coming from and uh, anything else you'd like to add, feel free to use the chat box as, um, as we go. We're going to have a discussion after, uh, I'll open all the mics actually, you'll be able to speak uh, once um, I say my piece and then you'll be able to comment and we'll have a discussion. So we've got Poland, Berlin, excellent. Uh, Romania, very good. Chicago, U.S., Nepal. Wow, that's good. Must be late Nepal, so I'm glad you made it. And how are you doing uh, with the situation? Are you at home or is your country allowing you to uh, move around? I think most parts of the world, yes. Most of us are at home. At least we have something in common <laughs> um, right now. We're, most of us are in the same boat and we're locked. Yeah, there's a lockdown in most parts of the world. Okay, and I guess that should make us feel equal in so many ways. And uh, if you're an educator, if you could add that in the chat, if you're not an educator or teacher, if you could also add that if you're a parent, if you're here as a parent, or if you're here um, as an administrator, you can add that. So I see Anna says home shopping and yeah, taking the dog for a walk. A lot of people have uh, decided that they need to get a dog just so they get a chance to walk. Ah, so we've got a librarian instructor. Thank you, Laura. We've got a teacher educate, Dinesh um, from Nepal. And um, Megan is a teacher, teacher, all right, so we don't have any parents. Ah, grandparents. Well, of course, yes. Uh, some of you may be grandparents. And we're all parents. But I thought someone who's not a teacher. Okay, so we've got Rebecca, who's a parent. Okay, excellent. And not um, a teacher. Okay, great. Okay, so um, wherever you're coming from, um, you're very welcome to this session. My name is Nellie Deutsch, and um, a little about me. I've been um, teaching for over 40 years. English is a foreign language as a second language. I'm originally from Toronto, Canada. I uh, have been involved in uh, using technology since 1993, in, um, not in virtual classes until 2003. Uh, with Moodle. I specialize in Moodle and use Moodle extensively, as well as Zoom and other virtual classes. I provide free uh, professional development, online professional development for teachers. I've been doing this since 2006 because I love teachers and I do all I can. I'll tell you a little bit about my philosophy as we go so that you get an idea and maybe you'll understand why I give these free um, professional development courses online. So at the center uh, is the learner. And I think that we all feel that way, but it doesn't always happen. Sometimes it's kind of difficult to um, have that happen in the classroom, especially when there are management problems and uh, we want it to happen, but we don't always know how. Uh, providing autonomy supported teaching to students is also something that most teachers would like to happen in the classroom, but it doesn't always happen. I've been practicing this both face to face, but right now, since uh, we're doing remote, the, the idea behind this session is to discuss how we can provide remote uh, autonomy supportive teaching to our learners and it doesn't matter what age but not only as teachers but also as parents at home 
Uh, because of the situation, a lot of parents um, are actually supporting their kids at home. It's not easy for young learners, especially uh, for the K-12 learner to learn online and parents are home. So it's only natural that they're there. And the kind of support that they provide um, should also promote uh, autonomous learners. And that's, I think that's what's important here. So um, we're going to be discussing self and other oriented relationship interactions and engagement, interjection versus integration, intrinsic motivation, techniques for, autonomous, for the autonomous learner, and peer teaching and learning. If you have any questions at any time, if you want me to clarify anything, this is not a formal session. It's actually very open. I'm gonna go through this quite quickly. So, whoops wasn't meant to happen. Let me try to go back here and reset that. Uh, okay, I'm gonna have to stop the share and go back. So, um, oh, now it's working. Okay, the mute's working. So I see a, more people have joined. Let me get back to the screen share here. Uh, I must have clicked on something. Okay, there it is. So um, if you have any questions or any comments, feel free as you go. Yes, teacher coach, that's very, very good. That's one way of helping learners uh, stay in the forefront. The idea, of course, is to get learners to do most of the work, and that's what this is about. The relationship you have with yourself actually is very important because it mirrors the kind of relationship you will have with your students and with your audience. So think about that and think about yourself. What happens to you in the classroom, whether it's virtual and whether it's face-to-face? -face. Right now, in most cases, it's virtual. The kind of relationship that you have with yourself. Now, what does that mean? What relationship am I supposed to have with myself, you may ask. Any suggestion in the chat, feel free to add. What is a relationship with myself? Well, you don't see my, um, let me see why you don't see it. You don't see the uh, presentation. Let me see if I stopped it. No, it seems to be working. Nobody else sees it. Okay, so let me stop and go back. See if I can get that back. Tell me if you see it now. Do you see it now? You should be able to see it. Yes, okay, perfect. It's a Google Drive, which is kind of problematic with the presentations because sometimes it kind of messes up. Okay, great. So what is a relationship with yourself? If you could just, you know, when you think of a relationship with yourself, what are you thinking of? Because usually we think of relationships with others. So what is the relationship with yourself, really? Okay, a relationship with yourself is your interactions. Um, how you talk to yourself. Are you hard on yourself? Are you soft with yourself? Do you blame yourself when things go wrong? All these things... Uh, focus on your relationship, the kind of uh, self-talk that you have with yourself. Uh, your engagements, how do you engage with other people? How do you engage with content? How do you engage with technology? Uh, do you blame? Okay, so when we talk about uh, learner autonomy, we talk about these things. We talk about the learner, how the learner feels about himself or herself, um, the dialogues they have, are they confident, um, are they hard on themselves, do they blame themselves, the same things that a teacher would go through. Interjection is forcing ourselves to do things. For example, I should do this, I should do that. Uh, how many of you um, are hard on yourself, would you say? 
you expect a lot from yourself if you could just say yes no a little bit sometimes that's what interjection means it means coercing yourself to do things that you don't really want to do sometimes okay we all are sometimes um okay but sometimes um it's hard it's hard for us when we say well i should have done this i should have done that i should do this and then you don't yeah working on being kinder to yourself is really important because that's how you're going to work with your students it'll be a lot easier for you if you're kind and uh, don't force yourself to do things and be gentle so that's um okay let me it's not going whoops so what are some of the things that interjection refers to it refers to circumstances what happens when things happen like the coronavirus um, how do you take it do you blame anybody do you feel uh, frustrated what happens to you are you blaming the government are you blaming china um do you think that uh, we should do more your government should do more what position do you take you're scared that's right but being scared does that make you blame do you think that um, we're in this situation um, for a reason the way we experience circumstances is very important because we can't help but come up with uh, reasons why we don't like it it's not right we shouldn't have this that's good if you don't blame that's good but if you look if you watch the news you'll hear them blaming or listen to politicians everybody seems to be blaming um you know and why okay so what happened not now that's interjection interjection is trying to find a reason and sometimes forcing others to do what you want so how can we communicate and provide our students with the kind of instructions that don't put them in a position of interjection any suggestions on how to not make students feel that they're forced to do something because when we feel forced we usually blame and we don't want our students to blame us or parents to blame us for the activities that they have to do i don't know about you but in my school right now parents not just in my school in the whole country parents are complaining and blaming the ministry uh, for having too many activities there aren't enough uh, laptops in the house or computers uh, they're not happy with the situation anything like that happening in your country or parents complaining or teachers complaining about the fact that it's not working the parents have to be there and they can't be there because some of them are working from home yeah they're complaining okay i'm wondering i i hear i see that in europe they're complaining um I wonder about other countries i know that the situation is more or less the same uh, not everybody's ready for remote learning i think most countries are not so what's the opposite of inter inter in um interjection if you don't use force and you don't tell students you have to do this by a certain time you have to come online you have to i'm talking about the k-12 university students are um, are okay i suppose because they're independent but yeah they're complaining about teachers because they think teachers aren't doing their jobs they don't know what they're doing they don't know how to teach online so integration 
is the opposite. It's not using force. It's not coercing kids to attend live online classes. It's giving them a choice. And that's where the autonomy, the learner autonomy comes in, giving learners a choice. That doesn't mean that you let them do what they want, but you give them a choice and they will have consequences. So if uh, a student doesn't turn up for class and misses the work, they're going to have to take responsibility, but they have a choice. You can either attend or not attend. If you attend, you'll be able to get the information, do the work, and be graded accordingly. But if you don't attend, you'll have to take the responsibility. You'll have to learn the material by yourself. You'll have to, you'll, maybe you'll get a low grade and so on. In other words, letting the learner take ownership and providing the learner with a choice, uh, but still being in control. Of course, the teacher is always going to be in control, but providing choice. Students want to be listened to. They, they feel that they're not listened to, especially certain ages. If we're talking about the K-12, the age of uh, 13, I guess, uh, teenagers, they want to be heard. So let them provide whatever they wish, and then you give them a choice. Okay, so you want to do this? That's fine. You can do this or you can do that. But you're going to be responsible for whatever choice you make. So just the fact that you provide them with choices makes them feel that you care and that you're not forcing them to do what they don't want to do. And sometimes that's all they want. By letting go of control, that's integration. It's letting go of my way is the only way. I'm the teacher. I know best. I've studied for years. And, and you don't know. You're just a kid. And same thing for parents. Uh, this goes for parents too. Uh, allowing children to have a voice and providing them with choices. Okay, you want to do this? Well, you can do that, but there's a consequence. You're going to have to be responsible for whatever choice you make. And this could be done from a very, very early age. Letting go of control and allowing children and even adults, but I think it's even stronger with children, allowing them to understand that there are choices, but there are also consequences to whatever choice you make. Control is a powerful thing and teachers have this and sometimes we misuse this. And I'm in that boat too. When the class gets rowdy or when one child or maybe two um, lose control, it's very easy for teachers to also lose control. And that's where learning to understand ourselves is very important. And learning that no matter what happens, it's never the kid's fault and it's never your fault. It just happens. So taking the blame for somebody else's actions doesn't make sense. And we have to keep that in mind. Blame is a huge thing that really is in opposition to integration and autonomy. Blaming, self-blame and blaming others doesn't work. And if you're watching TV these days, and I watch, um, there's a lot of blame. Polit politicians are blaming each other and there's a lot going on besides the COVID-19 in most countries. Circumstances happen. And we don't have control over what happens. As Alfred Adler uh, said, we experience reality always through the meaning we give it. So it doesn't matter what happens. It's not the circumstance that has meaning. It's us. 
the meaning we give it. So it might mean one thing to one person and something else to an, something else to another, which is really important. And that's why there should be some kind of a dialogue among the students. Circumstances are different for everyone. So shine yours and, and see what the truth is. What is the truth? Is it how I feel? Is it how you feel? Is it how I see it? Is it how you see it? Where's the truth? Okay, everybody is right. And that's why we need to support one another and our students, the learners. So that's a little bit, um, I think there are more. Um, that's why we have to support the learner so that they can learn about themselves we could do this by developing and strengthening their intrinsic motivation. And this could be done in different ways. We don't have to reward them with prizes because that's extrinsic and it doesn't usually work. What works is reasons. If we could provide learners with reasons, why? We ask them to do what we do. How many of you explain to your students why you're asking them, especially now with remote um, distance learning, uh, do you provide them with reasons why you do, why you ask them to do a certain task? How many of you explain to your students why you're giving them a certain task? I'm going to ask you to do this and that, and the rationale behind it. Not the goals, not the goals, think about it, not the goals. Reasons why you ask them to read a certain passage. Okay, give me an example of a reason for doing something. Okay, providing reasons is really important to students. Otherwise, they, will feel, they may feel forced unless they understand the reasons behind it. So one of the things that I do when I can't think of a reason and when there's chaos, or at least I think there's chaos, but my interpretation of chaos is never somebody else's interpretation of chaos. So what I do in the middle of the class, is breathe that's what i do i literally take a deep breath whenever i'm feeling pressured within myself that's what i do how many of you do that or have done it yes excellent that's great rebecca wonderful i want to go a little faster here because i want to get to clarity as i said it's really important and after you take a deep breath you'll notice that you become more reasonable your emotions subside and you're able to clarify things and see a truer picture of what's going on and you're able to give explanations and provide the informations we are limited and that's where our students can help. Let them be responsible. They could do so much. You know, I remember um, over 20 years ago, uh, one parent came up to me and he said, listen, you get paid, but my daughter does most of the work. I said, that's right, I'm so happy. Uh, you know, we get paid, but not to do the work. It's our learners that need to do the work and they need to learn the choices, as I said before, have responsibility and they can take the responsibility. What I do online usually, I uh, use these tools. I'm just gonna go through them very quickly. But what I do in the classroom, whether virtually or face-to-face, -face, is I allow the students, I give them a choice. You can work on your own or you can work with a team. How many of you 
offer choices, teamwork or individual work. Give them a choice. Now they'll learn the consequence because sometimes working on your own is a lot harder and you have to do a lot more work and it might be boring. So they'll learn about that, but at least they have a choice. You have a choice. You can work in teams or you can work on your own. Is it easy? Sometimes for some people working on a team is even harder. So collaboration is not for everybody. So just because I believe in it and I know it's good for you, it doesn't mean that I can enforce it. So give them a choice, even though you know what's best. Uh, what I usually do online, of course, is the breakout rooms. That's one way of working on teams and peer teaching. I let the kids and the adults, and uh, Anna knows about this, I let them do the work. Peer teaching and peer learning empowers and it helps intrinsic motivation. They get motivated when they can teach each other. It gives them a chance to feel that they own whatever they're learning and they know something. So the tools such as chat box in the live virtual class, videos, YouTube, Vimeo, there's so many different ways of sharing uh, information online or if you're working in a face-to-face -face classroom, they can also share it within the classroom if you have uh, the technology. Let them use their phones. Most kids these days and students, adult students have phones and they can share so much. That's what technology is about these days. And we know that uh, with the COVID-19, we can share so much. So what we're gonna do now And these are young kids teaching one another. Now this might be at home, but that's what they like to do naturally. So let them do it in the classroom. Let them teach each other. Okay, so now what we're going to do is, I hope um, we've got time. I wanted this to be an hour and a half, um, but we don't have that much time. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna give you a chance to um, share uh, some of your thoughts. I've given you the information really, really fast. So feel free to ask questions. I'll unmute you all, but um, I'll let you unmute yourselves one at a time. Okay, so let's uh, get rid of this and see each other. All right, so if you've got a, a camera, feel free to open it so we can see each other. I see Susanna and Amy, hi there. Now we can see each other. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot better. All right, so let's hear. Any comments, uh, things that went through your mind as you were listening to a really, really fast uh, talk about uh, integration and interjection and choices and learner autonomy and what does it really mean? Okay, you can. Re oh, there we're you go. having a lot of trouble on. Yeah, hi, we're having a lot of trouble on my team. I teach um, literacy and social studies for fifth grade, and something that we've been having trouble engaging our students. This is. We're going into our third week of virtual learning um, and we're creating like a Google Slides presentation with directions on it and it has links or um, a way for them to get to a different Google Classroom assignment um, and they're just having a lot of trouble like even some of the higher kids within the group um, accessing the materials and, and guiding themselves through something that they've never done before. And so we're willing to reach out and try to help them with that. And we've tried to make it as simple as possible, but something that I noted in the comments that was, that's really been struggle for our team is how to differentiate within those lessons and to, to reach all of our students. Like I have six students in my class that have disabilities and 
like when I was on the phone with one of them last week, they said, I'm doing all of my assignments by myself. And I was like, oh, and then I went to look and see what she had done. She hadn't done any of them. They, they were open. She had opened them and looked at them, but I know that she can't read them on her own. And she didn't fill anything out, which I wouldn't have expected her to, but it's just interesting. You know, I liked a lot of the concepts about giving them choice and and reason as to why but my question and it's hard too because our we're doing what our district is asking us to do you know they they're providing the special education teachers and reading specialists the assignment of trying to differentiate some of our product and information but we're still not able to make it fully accessible for them they're still i think learning something but um it's i think that's just been a big struggle is connecting in that way to each of those individual students. Any suggestions from anyone? I mean, I have something. What about parents? I didn't ask if parents are involved. Are they involved? Um, for some students, parents have been in touch and we've been contacting them. We call parents um, in all our classes every week um, as part of our um, duties, uh, according to the, our district. Um, which I enjoy and we're able to try to talk to the kids sometimes as well but because something else I mentioned in the comments is um, I teach fifth grade and they're not requiring anything um, it's not graded they're asking us to tell them who's doing it but like when the kid says like I've been playing outside and spending time with my parents and learning to cook and I'm like that's great were you able to access your materials online Oh yeah, I'm working on them. Oh, okay. Bye. I'll talk to you later. Like go to check at the end of the week and they haven't done anything, which honestly for me doesn't bother me that much. I, I'm just glad that they're engaging with their families and, and doing some sort of learning activities, but I don't know what else we as teachers, as a team should do to engage some of those students and encourage them to want to do the activities more. I mean, this is all they've ever wanted to do in class is watch videos and play games. And now they don't want to do anything. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Any, any comments on that? Feel free to uh, unmute your mic. You know, it's amazing I'm, how it seems to be the same everywhere. It doesn't matter where you live, we're all encountering the same uh, challenges. One thought that's yes. just a uh, first idea might be, breaking things into smaller chunks, at least especially for the students, for whatever reason, need more support or more check-in, don't have as much parental support. If it isn't possible for you to check in with all of them more often, is it possible for them to do something that other people would interact with, like post comments somewhere, and then you ask people to respond to other people's comments or something. So there's some sense of, I wanna do this and see what my friends think about it and tell my friends what I think about it as, as kind of little pieces along the way. I, that's a first thought that comes to my mind. Yeah, that's where Padlet comes in handy. But then you're using Google Docs, you're using Google, I guess. So it's Google Slides and Google Things. Uh, which isn't easy for everybody. Any other comments about um, what we're doing and um, some of the comments that I made about uh, getting students to, learners to be independent? Because that's what we're asking them. Yes, go Hi, ahead. Nelly. This Hi, Nelly. Karina. Karina from Poland. I'm not presentable today, so I don't want you to see me or go there and see me tired. Uh, I, since this coronavirus, I've been teaching so much and so very many online classes. And the reason is simple, because the teachers in Poland are not prepared to teach with technology. And I really feel sorry for them. Thanks to Nelly. Uh, I, it's been years I've been learning from Nelly, and now I have the clue how to do it. And nowadays, I just don't know even how 
would I teach without technology? And my students, I am retired. I've been teaching 46 years now, for 46 years now, so I'm kind of experienced. But <laughs> thanks to Nelly, the technology is my, my, my word right now and I'm extremely passionate and dedicated and my students they 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 really like it and I love them. They know I do. I love them and I'm helping them all the way around and teaching them all all all, all topics, not the maths, not physics, but <laughs> humanities. And they uh, what I want to tell you Nelly, you told me, you you taught me that the student is the most important. So I do believe in that. And what I do, I even don't think about it. My students, they have to be active because <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they just can't sit and listen to me. Even at that time uh, when I used to teach and give lectures at the university, I used Nelly's methods, and during the lectures, even my students were not supposed to sit, look, and watch and make notes. They were active. I had them searching for the information. I I let them have the mobiles active during the lectures. And when my director of my department came to to the the lecture room, she got really shocked. Harina you are allowing them to use the mobiles and use the laptops. Yes, I do, this is the reason I'm, and, but nobody understood me. And nowadays, this technology is just killing poor teachers because they don't know, they don't know how to do this. Even Zoom, which is kind of an easy platform, I think. It's just when you don't know how to use it, you're just making mistakes. And for young, young students who are much better at technology than I am, for example, because I still learn from them. I, I just click something and they are laughing at me and they will tell you, oh, my teacher, do not touch it. <laughs> do not touch it. This is what you should do. But what I want to tell you, that this um, ignorance, this is like, I don't know if I'm not, uh, She's a professor. I'm only master <laughs> in humanities. But Anna Thank is a professor. You. And I don't know if she <laughs> agrees with me that our teachers, they need to be educated. In, it's not the 19th century. It's 21st century. And there's so many possibilities. Thank but you, Anna. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna stop you here. I think the problem today is not so much technology, it's the kids and the students. How many of you are teaching in higher education? Anyone here? Not now. Anyone? So everybody's young learners, is that, or K-12? Okay, that's no, where the problem- I teach adults. No, yeah. I teach adults. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you're the, I think you and Anna are the only ones because that's where the problem is. The problem, yes, go ahead, Amy. Sorry, I was just saying fifth, like I was indicating the grade level with my hand. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what the problem is. I mean, we're facing, it's a world problem um, where families don't have enough computers, where the kids need help because they can't do it. So they need their parents and their parents are busy. And, and it's turned into a family affair. Uh, remote learning is not just about, um, you know, one kid in the family, it's about three, four, five, depending on the family, how many kids. So it's, it's really problematic. It's, it's beyond what anybody has imagined. So I think what you said, Amy, about the fact that you're okay with it, as long as they're doing something, as long as, okay, they're learning to cook or they're learning something that interests them. I mean, the districts, you're right. The districts may, you know, uh, ask us to do certain things and expect teachers to do certain things. But I don't think that we should, you know, um, we should take it uh, personally if the kids are learning one thing and not something that um, we uh, decided for them, you know, maybe give them choices. You know, maybe they can do something if they're interested in the cooking, maybe they can do something with that. 
and Google Docs or Google Slides, let them teach the others how to cook or something. You know, this is a chance really uh, to uh, do different things. It doesn't have to be just, uh, you know, kind of book work um, that, you know, that we usually do in the classroom, in the physical classroom. So I think just the fact that they're learning uh, may be, you know, is great. They're learning about life. Um, anyone else would like to share uh, what's happening in their neck of the woods and how they're managing and some of the challenges and, and how they're um, viewing uh, learner autonomy because that's what they're asking for right now. They're asking to be free of us <laughs> teachers. They want to work on their own. Um, any comments? Uh, yeah, this is James from Tennessee. Hi. I know. I know when we um, when we started going to the online format. I'm a high school foreign language and English teacher, and um, I I the the thought that occurred to me as I thought about this was that we were entering a world without C students, and my A and my B students they really care about the subject, and a lot of them you know I've given them things to do on their own, but they they still want to talk about what they're learning, and these are are natural. Are natural learners and the kids that are, were failing and doing poorly their parents are really leaning on them because our district has made it possible for them to still improve their grade but the kids who frankly would rather spend an extra half hour at lunch you know than in my classroom or the ones who you know really couldn't have cared less you know for the time that I was with them you know I haven't heard too much from them and I don't expect to anymore and I don't know I think long term you know, this should get parents and students as well as teachers asking what's the essence of learning? You know, it's not a babysitting. You know, a lot of us sometimes feel like, like glorified babysitters um, for our time that we have with the kids. But um, I know I've really, especially in my foreign language class, I teach German, which isn't very widely spoken in the United States. Uh, I've really tried to emphasize that and uh, just, the, just the love of it. And I, I do see that paying off again in this, fraction of, of students that I would call a B students but um, I just I do wonder if we could you know if there's some way to make uh, autonomy viral <laughs> you know that kids could catch on to this and, and want it for themselves instead of expecting us to just present stuff any any suggestions from your end um, I think there are a few language teachers here foreign language teachers uh, anything that you came up with on how to do this how to get them to um, you know, become more interested in, uh, do they have to take, is it compulsory to take German or it's um, optional? It's compulsory to take two years of a foreign oh. language. So they could have taken Spanish or, or other languages. So, I mean, I, I just give them a chance to talk, you know, when we Zoom twice a week. Um, and then, as I said, but I, I have 37 students and on a given week, I'll have about 13, you know, that are mm. taking part. And I have another half dozen who will do the assignments that I post online, but I'm nowhere near 100% effective um, with the kids that I was before. What about choices? How do you feel about that? Choices for what, I'm sorry? Giving them choices. In other words, asking them, you know, what they wanna do maybe. Mm -hmm. If you can reach them, that's what you're yeah. saying. Cause right now you need to reach them. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like Susan's idea of, of inviting guest speakers. Um, mm -hmm. I've got, I like the, uh, and I've thought about like playing, playing videos or, you know, organizing a, a session to hear a story or something like that. Have you tried Kahoot? I've, I've, I've also, I do a lot of Kahoots at, at the end of each session, whatever we're doing, I do a Kahoot sure. with them. Uh, and they love that, you know, to have some kind of game. If you're doing German, maybe Quizlet live. Have you done that? Hmm. But games have been successful. I've played games with them a few times and they do enjoy, you know, trying, trying to, to take part. But what about the others, right? You said 37 and you're only getting 13. Yeah. Well, again, they, they either log in or they don't, you know, I, I, I contact, uh, you know, I can't, I can't, I, I can't call them up. <laughs> yeah. I think it's challenging for us because we have to think of ways to, um, you know, and how do you do it? You can't, well, you could call them up, I suppose, <laughs> uh, you know, by phone and, and ask them to come, but uh, you can't really force them to do anything um, right. at, at this time. Any other comments about what's happening? 
Uh, Susan, I think you started talking. Susanna, sorry. No, I think you're muted. You're muted. You need to unmute. Let me. Okay. Unmute. Uh, yes. Yes. I, I'm ready to to comment. Uh, one, uh, uh, but I think on the other hand, we want a huge opportunity here um, because when you are using Zoom like us, uh, we can invite foreign people to our classroom and it's a challenge for our students. Maybe we can get a friend from the other part of the world and invite him to our classroom to be interviewed by our students. It's a challenge and it's real language in real context. And they have the, never in our lifetime um, it's a real opportunity. It's absolutely different. Uh, but on the other hand, you can invite, especially on your, on your subject, maybe you are a geography teacher. Why don't you invite a specialist on some topics, maybe of interest? And uh, you can do a, a huge difference and that way your students uh, are going to be interested. It's absolutely different. We are opening our classrooms to the world. So I, I feel passionate about that. Yeah, I think you're right. It's a chance uh, um, maybe to invite, um, I don't know if you know people from Germany, maybe invite their children or the you know, same age to come to your class, to a Zoom class. Uh, maybe and have them, you know, interview, talk to each other or something. Yeah, it is a chance. Uh, I think Susanna's right. A chance, uh, if not for adults, for other teachers to come, but maybe for kids so that, you know, uh, they can connect and they'll feel that there's some um, interest, common interest, maybe. Um, good ideas. Anyone else have any suggestions on? how to um, empower, as they say, how to make uh, learners feel uh, that they can work on their own and that it comes from them. Yes, go ahead, Rebecca. Um, so I have uh, six kids at home. Um, I've got eight kids, but six of them at home. And so we're doing the, a lot of the, you know, of course, online, trying to jump through those hurdles. And then I also teach a, a high school class. So I'm kind of coming at it as a parent and as an educator. But one of the things that has given my kids a sense of, of ownership over their online education is that they've come up with a little block schedule for themselves. So they know that they have to do their work, but they get to choose the block of time during the day when they want to do it. And um, they set up the block and they share that with me. And then when I see that they're not on task, then I'm like, oh, what are you up to right now? They're like, oh, I'm in the block of time when this is my unplugged time and this is this or whatever it is, but, but they've, outlined it they've chosen when they're going to work on certain things and then i just get to serve as a little reminder every once in a while well what did you have on your schedule for for right now what is it that you that you wanted to work on when you set up your schedule and that has seemed to be effective for a couple of them that they have the chance to choose when they're working on it and then yeah. Another thing that um, I think has been helpful in getting students to follow through and actually complete their assignments, um, I think it's good to have a midway checkpoint where you say, what was a question you had about this assignment? What was a challenge you had in completing it? And then you have the opportunity to either say, hey, good job overcoming that and doing some problem solving, or if they're like, well, you know, I just didn't get to it. Oh, and why is that? Then you can problem solve with them. 
and um, have them come up with a solution like, oh, I just keep forgetting. Oh, okay, so is there a way that we could come up with a reminder? Would a reminder on your phone work or what kind of visual reminder could you have? So, um, but encouraging them to ask a question and knowing that they are going to have questions because a lot of times they're hesitant to say, I don't understand your instructions. I don't really understand what I'm supposed to be doing. So if I go to them and say, what's your question? It kind of, um, it takes that, oh, that wall down and then we can start the dialogue with problem solving. Because you're putting it to them. That's, mm -hmm. that's right. You're putting them to them. In other words, it's not you uh, kind of uh, manipulating them but you're offering them a chance to open up and understand, I mean, to, to dialogue with themselves. Actually, it's, a, you know, it's a self dialogue. You're, you're kind of there for them, but they're thinking things through. I think that's excellent. What age groups are we talking about? What ages? For, for students? No, uh, you're talking about your, your children, right? Well, my kids are ages 11 through 18. And then my students are high school students. Yeah, that I got. So you're working with your kids at home. I think your, your, your students are really lucky, your high school students, because you seem to be doing the right things at home and you're with your kids as well. So um, it's great to have a mom. I mean, that would be ideal <laughs> for a lot of us if our, um, our students' parents were actually um, teachers like you, like yourself. Rebecca, that would be a lot of use because right now we're facing huge problems with parents who uh, can't help. They don't know how. So you need to actually help the parents so they can help their kids. But maybe that's the right time. That's what I think Susanna also said. This is a chance for us to really, and I think you also mentioned it. Uh, what's your first name? Sorry. Um, I heard Steve, but I don't think that's right. Um, I didn't get your first name. I, I see Dietz, the German teacher. Sorry. Uh, what's your first name? You're muted. James. Sorry. Yeah, James. Uh, James, James. Sorry, James. Um, what James said about, you know, it's, it's really um, a chance for us to, to learn how to, how to, how to be teachers, you know, how, how to motivate, how to, because we are facing uh, real issues. It's not like we're in control of the classroom and not being in control is really an opportunity uh, to learn how to do it in such a way that invites them to, um, to initiate instead of, uh, you know, enforcing things on them that we could actually use instead of interjections, we could actually uh, use integration at this time and figure out a way to um, to do it and then become you know um, more autonomy supportive teachers when we get back into the classroom whenever that happens i think we'll be in a better place if we do it if we try at least you know try to figure it figure it out any other comments feel free to unmute your mics i, I see that again I again yes well, I'm uh, thinking of all the comments here, and uh, I need to tell you, I'm really passionate. So it's probably the reason that my students just follow me without questioning. But what I do, I'm a little tricky, because I would tell them, oh, I don't know. What are you going to do today? Just give me, give me an, any idea. And I would ask them what they would like to do today. What, what would mm -hmm. be the topic that you, they would be interested in? And I give them the, the, choice. the, the choices and they That's do good. choose. And then I, I'm a little bit tricky because I very often <laughs> I pretend, I don't know, just show me, just tell me, how do I get yeah. into it? Let them and do they, the work. Yeah, and they teach yes. me. And because I am an elderly lady, so they are so happy that they can, they can teach help. me things. Yeah. And, and this is why I, I really, I, I always get very, very nice interaction and cooperation. Very but important. It's very tiring. This yeah, that's time, true. I, I that's work true. like 90 minutes always because these are language classes. I do yeah. Polish as a second language and English. So 
it's really tiring because five hours a day I teach Polish, then I switch into English, and then I, I my brain is washed. <laughs> but I love it, and my students trust me. They wait. Yeah, for that's, me important. For the that's important. That's important. I think Alina. Yeah, the trust comes because you're giving, you're letting them do the work instead of yes. doing it for them. They're doing. Chris has some great ideas there in the chat. I don't know if you've read it. Uh, Chris, can you speak, or or you're only able to uh, use the chat? You've got some great ideas about how to organize it, which is, uh, I think, is great because it's what I do too. But maybe other people don't think it's so great. Is when you're going to have a Zoom class, is to um, have them do the work during the Zoom. Um, James, that's what I do. Say so I have an hour and a half of Zoom. Um, I get them, I use the breakout rooms. They do the work. Um, I talk a little bit. I let them do a lot of the, most of the talking. And then they uh, work in small groups together. They do teamwork. If they want to, they can work on their own. But, but then they produce everything um, online at the same time. So they don't have to go back. Um, as Rebecca says, I, I don't give them homework because they're at home. They don't want homework. Um, you know, I think this idea of doing homework from what I, from what the kids told me, they hate it. Um, they'd rather be with their families. And right now they're connecting with their families and some of them are really happy to be home. I think that doing everything during the zoom, uh, the live class is probably the best way to go. Uh, you'll win them over. Um, They'll love you for it. And, uh, and I think that's, um, that's what they're going to pick up. Uh, yes, Chris. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, yeah, no, I've been listening. Um, some great ideas out there. And just um, you can use James as an example. I don't know his exact situation, but uh, I like this idea that, you know, once now we're not in a structured classroom environment that um, really deprives us of a lot of the the proxemics of communication, the face-to-face, -face, your ability to manage 12 students at once, um, that becomes a lot more difficult in the screen-to-screen -screen time. So I was thinking more of just like freeing up your, um, your student production time where you're not looking at student production over a 45-minute segment, but you might be looking at it over a week segment. And then how do you check in and make sure that kid's gonna be accountable for work along the way is putting in formatives where you might schedule a 15 minute face to face or a small group where you get a much more intimate one to one or small group. Uh, and then students must also check in with each other, as you're saying, breakout rooms on their own time or in the structured class time. Um, and then have some asynchronous, you know, if they're working on a Google Doc, then you can pop in once a day or once every couple of days and give them feedback on on how they're doing. And so that the student product cycle becomes a little bit different. Now you're looking at something they're going to do <clears throat> over a week's time. So in a language learning, I teach elementary. Um, and so you might put in something like a student monologue where they have to work up a monologue and iterate it all through the week, doing reflections, getting student feedback, perfecting their oral presentation. And then you might do that over two or three weeks. So they have the same assignment that repeats three or four times. So they know how to manage all the stop points along the way. Um, and that puts them kind of in total control of what their product is going to be. So those are just like some ideas I'm kind of throwing out there. But one is kind of like to put in more iterative cycles of work that are going to culminate in a week's time or a two weeks time. And then to repeat those same things. I know with the littler kids, they, um, they, they like that predictability to be able to manage their own learning product. Um, and then that frees you up to be able to kind of come in and give them the appropriate feedback and also for them to give each other feedback along the way. So I don't know if those things are useful, but that's kind of what I was thinking during this screen to screen teaching time. That's great. That's great, uh, Chris, because I think that we can all follow that. And it's true. Um, things have changed. Our timelines have changed. We're not, um, you know, we can't expect the same things that we normally expect from our students. Um, grades are different. We're evaluating them in different ways. Um, so those are really good points. And I think um, anybody else, uh, I think our time is, is almost over. It's only an hour. Um, any other suggestions? I think that what you suggested might uh, be useful 
uh, to Rebecca as well. Uh, but what about teachers who ex who do a lot of things? You know, they um, as a parent, you know, parents uh, seem to complain that their their kids are getting a lot of assignments and they're not managing them in general. Um, you know, I think they should hear from you, Chris, because I think you really have the answer. There's no hurry. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, We're I, home. I definitely don't have all the answers. And, and I, I, I think that's the important thing, too, is that we keep the, those reflection cycles among teachers uh, as playful as possible, that this is a time where we're supposed to be playing with all these new tools and coming up with different ideas. And then when we do go back into the classroom, finding out which parts of those asynchronous and synchronous times are, are helpful to bring back in. Um, I, I, I think about it more through a lens of Vygotsky of like tool and environment. Um, what are the tools in your environments and how do you leverage them uh, in, in your learning approach? And so right now the tools are a lot of these digital things. How do we leverage those? Um, so anyway, great ideas yeah. out there. Yeah, we're not, we're not really t talking about, we're actually experiencing it. Uh, and I think reflections, you all mentioned, both Chris and Rebecca, I think mentioned reflections, um, you know, um, encouraging the, uh, the students to reflect and think about it and just get them to, to talk things out. I think the dialogues are really important. So thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you for joining this uh, session. Thank you to you. <laughs> and um, let's keep in touch because I think that, um, you know, through um, these sessions, we can really help one another. Um, so uh, let's try. All right, thank you everyone. You're welcome to join, by the way, my free professional development courses if you're interested. It's on Moodle for Teachers. Uh, you'll find it um, in the discussion under my name. Dr. Nelly? On the name, yes. Um, do you think that we would be able to um, get some sort of like email or um, like indicate? some sort of like certificate from you indicating that we attended this with you today. Um, if we're sharing like professional development with our um, administrators. I don't know. What is Steve? Have you asked Steve about that? Um, I don't know if they do that. I know I do it. I do it um, in my courses. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in the courses, we also have synchronous as well as asynchronous. So if you want to join the courses, uh, I would gladly, because um, we do. The courses are based on, so you're welcome to join. I think Susanna has received, um, right, Susanna, you took some of my um, online courses, and Anna has a lot, has taken a lot of, over the years. So, But I'm not sure about this. Um, because I'm not in charge, really. Um, this is not my uh, my Zoom room. It's Steve's room room. So I don't really, um, I can't really okay. control. But it's possible. It is possible. Maybe you should talk to Steve about that, because I know it is possible. Um, he gets a list of all the attendees. I don't get that list, I mean, unless I ask for it. And through the list, um, I think it's possible. So I'll, I'll also suggest it, Amy. Could you and share in the chat? Steve's contact information. I think you got that on the Ning. You came through from the Ning, right? How did you get yes. here? Yeah, from the Ning. Yes. So you'll be able to see it there. Uh, okay. Or you can, or you can um, ask me on the Ning and uh, we can talk about that. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Thank you and good luck. We're all on, in this together. Remember that. <laughs> Bye.